Hello everybody, welcome to The Political Vigilante. My name is Graham Elwood. This video coming up was made by Jeff Epstein from Citizens Media TV, and it is his newest video <coughs> outlining what MMT is. Many of you are like, Graham, what is this? So I just wanted to put this video out there. Jeff made it, and it really summarizes what it is and why it's important that we all know what it is. And it is in my MMT playlist. If you're new to learning about MMT, go to my, I, every interview I've done about MMT with economists and experts in the field, there's a whole uh, separate MMT playlist. Please check that out. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, share the videos. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, thank you especially to Kim and Ambrose for hosting this. Um, my name is Jeff Epstein. This is an introduction to modern monetary theory, or MMT. Oh, and I should say, uh, this I'm normally hosted by Our Revolution South Jersey. When are we going to get serious, Candy, about the debt? We got to deal with this big long-term debt problem, or it will deal with us. But it's very simple. The government works like your house works. Our government has promised far more money than it actually has or probably ever will have. We have to reduce our deficit, and we have to get back on a path that will allow us to pay down our debt. We understand America is broke. There is an urgent need for us to contain the growth of the deficit. Taking money from our children and borrowing from China. Our rising debt levels poses a national security threat. We're broke. America's broke. It is to take out a credit card from the Bank of China in the name of our children, driving up our national debt. When we raise and borrow all this money, 42 cents out of every dollar coming out of Washington, it's borrowed. 47% is coming from other countries like China. Okay, so thank you, Jeff, for putting that together for me. Mine is much longer. Uh, so these, these are things you've heard your whole lives. They should be very familiar to you. And by the end of this presentation, you will begin to understand why pretty much every single word that was said is completely wrong. Okay? So mainstream economics says that big things are not possible without causing economic Armageddon. Modern monetary theory, or MMT, demonstrates that big things are possible. They're possible now. They have always been possible and is possible to do without causing economic problems. Therefore, most of what most, not much of what most of us understand to be true is completely wrong. And not just wrong, but wrong in a way that serves the wealthy few so they remain the wealthy few. So first I want to thank for helping me improve this presentation. Virginia Cotts, James Field Martinez, Aaron Taylor, Ben Siley, and Esha Krishnaswamy, among others. And I especially want to thank MMT economist Stephen Hale, who helped me ensure that what you're about to see is entirely accurate. So, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening with an open mind. I do know what I'm talking about, but I encourage you, when we're done, to be skeptical and do your homework and decide the truth for yourself. Most of your questions will be answered by the presentation itself. I am asking you to postpone your questions until the end. Jeff and I will stick around until there are no more questions. No problem. MMT is easy. It's simple and it's elegant. The only thing that is hard is letting go of our lifetimes of miseducation. MMT is a school of economic thought based on the ideas of Warren Mosler. He took ideas that some of which have been around for more than 100 years, brought them back, mixed them up, and now it is a school of economic thought based on 
25 years of research and scholarship developed by these economists and experts, among others. You will find most of these people are on Twitter and more than willing to answer your questions, and all of them will confirm everything I tell you today. I'm not an expert. I don't pretend to be an expert. I discovered MMT in February of last year when Jeff introduced it to me. Uh, what I am good at, what I can do, is I can introduce the basics of modern monetary theory as I learn from the economists. I can express what they taught me. When your eyes are open to MMT, however, it is time for you to move on to the experts to learn more. So first, what is money? What gives it value? And where does it come from? Money is a tool that the government uses to provision itself. They need things to be done. They have the people do them. And since we define the government, we are the government. We need these things to be done. We need to be defended. We need rule of law. We need infrastructure, scaling up cool inventions for bigger purposes. We need to gather intelligence. We need to take care of the people, lots of other things. So the government needs things to be done with the resources that we have, and it has the people do them. We sell our productivity and our resources to the government, and they give us their money as incentive in exchange. Money has value because it is backed by the full faith and credit of the government, and that's true. But more specifically, money has value because if we do not pay our federal taxes in the money that the government gave us, then we have faith that there will be severe penalties. That's what gives money value, federal taxes. This means you must get a job in order to get their money, in order to pay your federal taxes with their money, in order to avoid their, those penalties. In other words, federal taxes drive money. They force the people to need the money, and they establish and legitimize it, its use. And notice the order of operations. You cannot pay your taxes until you get money from the government. Like a paycheck from our job, you do what the government asks you to do. They give you money in exchange, and that money is yours to keep. You can do whatever you like with it. No strings attached. You owe it to no one. It is debt-free. Debt-free. That's important. So where does it come from? In 1971, the United States, along with many other countries, went off of the gold standard and became a fiat currency. Fiat just means that the money is not backed by anything physical. I'm going to answer this specifically for the United States, but there is a similar answer for many economies. Constitution of the United States, Article 1, Section 8, defines the powers of Congress. Two of those powers are to coin money and to provide punishment for counterfeiting. To coin money. To coin means to create. That doesn't mean metallic. To create. So as in to coin a phrase. So this means that Congress can create all kinds of money, paper bills, metallic coins, whatever else. Who creates the United States dollar? The answer is the central bank. In the United States, the central bank is called the Federal Reserve, but the Federal Reserve doesn't just create money because they want to create money. They create money when they are commanded to do so by the Treasury. The Treasury is commanded to do so by a law that the President signed and after the federal budget is passed. The law that the President signed was originally a bill written by 
Congress. And in our corrupt system, Congress is under the influence of big money lobbyists and donors. But the answer to who creates the dollar is the central bank. The answer to who authorizes the creation of the dollar is Congress. So Congress has the power to create money and to punish anyone else who tries to create money. This means that they are the only ones in the world who are allowed to authorize or appropriate the creation of the United States dollar. If resources are available, Congress can create as much money as they want to purchase those resources to do what needs to be done. This is an actual bill currently under consideration. This screenshot is from last year. This is the section of the bill for Elizabeth Warren and others who, uh, for the opioid, regarding the opioid epidemic. This is the section called the Authorization of Appropriations. Two billion, seven hundred million. For fiscal year 2019, same amount for subsequent years. This is the amount of money that is authorized to be created when this bill is passed into law and after the federal budget has passed. That amount is created because someone sat at a computer and typed that number into this document. This is the amount of money that the authors of the bill believe is necessary to purchase the resources that are necessary to implement this bill. And money is always created for a purpose, not just because they want pocket change. Everyone except Congress, everyone except the currency issuer, and I'll say more broadly the federal government, is a user of the currency. Me, you, families, our households, cities and towns, states, and even other countries, when it comes to the dollar, we are users of the currency. We are currency users, all in the same position aside from the amount that we have. And finally, all money comes from the currency issuer. Even if you work at a store, at a business that has, does no business with the government, say you work at a grocery store or at a restaurant, another company does have a contract with the government. They do whatever they're supposed to do. They get money from the government. Then they use that money to pay their employees. Their employees go shopping. One of their employees gives a big tip to a waitress at a restaurant. That waitress goes shopping at your grocery store, and then you get paid with that money. All money in the economy comes from the currency issuer. So that's where money comes from. And now let's talk about how money is created and how it works its way through the economy. This is done by a process called reserve accounting. So you have a calculator, you have 900 on your calculator. You wanna add 100 to it so you can make 1,000. Where does that 100 come from? Do you need to find it? Do you need to borrow it from another calculator? Do you need to pay for it? When you press 100, it is. It is as if you are the god of numbers on that calculator. And that is pretty much how the currency issuer creates its own money. Money exists when they will it to be. They are the god of their own money. And for the issuer only, the word spend is exactly equal to the word create. They spend money into the economy. They spend money into existence. They emit money into the economy. And think about it, if you are totally broke, pretend you are totally broke, you have no money in your bank account, in your pockets, nothing. But you are granted the power to create money whenever you need it. You can't keep it, you can only give it, you can only spend it. So my question is, if you had this power, do you really care that you have no money? So reserve accounting occurs at the country's central bank. How is the central bank relevant to us? 
I have a bank account at my local branch of Wells Fargo in my town on, well, on uh, Fork Landing Road along with a lot of other people and businesses. All of, there are local branches of Wells Fargo all around the country. And all of these branches with all of their customers and all of their bank accounts are managed by Wells Fargo Corporate. Wells Fargo Corporate, Wells Fargo itself has a bank account at the central bank. They have about $600 billion in their bank account. And that is a significant percentage of all of the bank accounts at all their branches. Every bank in the country has a bank account at the central bank. And more accurately, it's a spreadsheet. Two columns, the name of the bank, how much it has. So I have $1,000 in my bank account and my local bank. My bank has $600 billion in their reserve account or their reserves in the central bank. The central bank is the bank of the banks. It's also the top bank. There is no earth bank. There is no universe bank. The central bank in each country is the topmost bank that creates that country's currency. So we're going to do show three examples of reserve accounting. One where money is created, one where money is destroyed, and one where money is transferred. Example number one, grandma is owed $300 in social security benefits. How does the government give grandma those benefits? Social Security Administration determines that grandma is due $300. They communicate that to the central bank. The central bank communicates that to grandma's bank. And this is what happens. Grandma's bank's reserves are increased by $300. Grandma's bank account is increased by $300. And that's it. This is called marking up an account. Money is created because a number was made bigger with your finger, on a keyboard, on a computer, and in today's technology, on the internet. Example number two, destroying money. How does, we're starting over again. Grandma now owes federal taxes to the government, $100. How does grandma pay those taxes? This is example one, exactly opposite. Grandma sends in her tax return and a $100 check to the IRS. The IRS tells that to the central bank. The central bank communicates to grandma's bank. And this is what happens. Grandma's bank's reserves are reduced by $100. Grandma's bank account is reduced by $100. And that's it. This is called marking down an account. When numbers are made lower, <clears throat> money dies or is destroyed or disappears. When numbers are made bigger, money is created or born. Here's Ben Bernanke. He was the chairman of the Federal Reserve during the Great Recession in 2008. Commitments of a trillion dollars doubling the size of the Fed's balance sheet. Is that tax money that the Fed is spending? It's not tax money. The banks have um, accounts with the Fed much the same way that you have an account in a commercial bank. So to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account that they have with the Fed. So it's much more akin, uh, although not exactly the same, but it's much more akin to printing money than it is to borrowing. To lend to a bank, we simply use a computer to mark up the size of the account that they have at the Fed. And when he says not exactly the same, he just means not physical money, he means on a computer. So what happens when money dies or is destroyed? A child draws a bill onto a piece of construction paper, money's created. They erase that bill. What happened to that money? Where did it go? At the end of a game, the score is lowered down to zero again. What happened to those points? Where did they go? 
you have a thousand on the calculator, you minus a hundred from it, now you have nine hundred. Where did that hundred go? And the answer is it didn't go anywhere because it never existed to begin with. To us, to currency users, money's real. To the currency issuer, money is not real. It's a concept. Final example, transferring money. So this time, a, my company gives me a paper paycheck for $100. We have two separate banks. And this is nothing more than the first two examples put together. I get my paper paycheck from my company. I give that to my bank. My bank says you'll get that money in about 24 hours. My bank communicates that check to the central bank. And then this is what happens. On my company side, my, the company's bank account is lowered by $100. Their reserve, their bank's reserves are lowered by $100. And now on my side, my bank's reserves are raised by $100. And my bank account is raised by $100. This is reserve accounting. This is how money moves from one bank's reserves to another. Five trillion dollars moves through the Federal Reserve System to the central banking system in the United States every day. That's about two quadrillion dollars a year. All right, next chapter, created currency. So in the 1990s, economist Stephanie Kelton discovered Warren Mosler's ideas and thought that they were wrong. And she tried to prove them wrong. And in the course of doing so, she ended up proving him right. This is the result of that research. This is in her 1998 paper called Can Taxes and Bonds Finance Government Spending? This is most of the abstract. We're going to focus on just one sentence. Modern governments actually finance all of their spending through the direct creation of high-powered money. Modern governments actually finance all of their spending through the direct creation of high-powered money. Another way of saying this is every dollar of federal spending is and has always been financed with created currency. Every federal benefit every time it's paid. Every federal program and agency. Every federal salary. Every paycheck that has ever been received by a federal employee. The military is a federal program. Every piece, uh, every military personnel, the salary, and every piece of equipment is and has always been financed with created currency. And yet we often hear, I don't want my taxes paying for war. I want my taxes paying for uh, health care and, and education and education. But the military is a federal program. So how does that make sense? We also hear, I don't want my taxes paying for your big programs. But if it is a federal program, how does that make sense? Social Security is a federal program. Every Social Security benefit since the law was passed in 1935 has been financed with created currency. So how can Social Security ever go broke, be stolen from, be borrowed from? And the same is true with all federal benefits. How can its funds ever be squandered? And why would it ever need to save today in order to be able to pay tomorrow? And finally, why do we pay FICA taxes? Next chapter, federal taxes do not fund federal spending. Federal spending funds federal taxes. And this is not just a cute statement, it's precisely true. And remember the order of operations. 
You cannot pay your taxes until you get money from the government. Same abstract, different sentence. It is argued that the proceeds from taxation and bond sales are technically incapable of financing government spending. And when she says technically incapable, she means impossible. Economist Pavlina Cherneva, taxes are not stockpiled in any material sense for future respending. Economist Randall Ray, indeed, if government spends and lends currency into existence, it clearly does not need tax revenue before it can spend. Same paper, different, uh, not in the abstract. Taxes, uh, Stephanie Kelton. Taxes are not even capable of financing government spending since their collection implies their destruction. And destruction in the same way that the hundred is destroyed in our subtraction problem. All federal spending is financed with created currency, which means which logically extends that federal taxes do not pay for anything. And here's some evidence to emphasize this. During the Great Depression, the people had no money. And yet this is exactly when we paid for two of the most ambitious programs in the history of our country, World War, World War II and FDR's New Deal. Here's the entire abstract. Federal taxes do not pay for anything because, because all federal spending is financed with created currency, which is proven by the realities of reserve accounting. And that's the entire purpose of Stephanie Kelton's paper. Notice the sentence right before the two that we just analyzed. After carefully considering the complexities of reserve accounting, these are the conclusions that we draw. Next chapter. Since federal taxes don't pay for anything, then why do we pay federal taxes? Federal taxes drive money. Taxes make people need the money. So they do what the government needs, what we need. <clears throat> federal taxes control inflation, one of many tools to do so. We can raise taxes on a product or on the people themselves to reduce demand on a product. We could do the opposite. We can lower taxes on a product or on the people themselves to increase demand on that product. Federal taxes can also impose moral decisions. If we don't want the people to do something, the government can raise taxes on that in order to make it more expensive to do so. We could do the opposite. If the government, if we want the people to do something, the government can lower taxes on those activities to make it less expensive to do so. We can also tax the rich to discourage wealth inequality. <clears throat> we need to tax the rich because they're too damn rich. They profit off of our suffering, they purchase our politicians and laws, and they're making it such that we can't live on the planet anymore. Taxing the rich reduces their power, which instantly increases our power. We need to tax the rich because it is the moral and right thing to do, not because we need their money. Because with our current economy, it is not possible to get their money at the federal level. This is a graph representing the individual wealth of our members of Congress, personal wealth. 535 members total, 37 of those members in the yellow are in, have a personal wealth in the bottom 80%. 80% of the country is 260 million people and they are represented by 7% of Congress.
Next chapter. The Pony for All Act of 2018. So Hillary Clinton in her book regarding the 2016 campaign said to Bernie Sanders, It's so nice that you want to give everybody a pony, Bernie. Everybody would love a pony, but how are you going to pay for it? So I want to do a thought experiment. Let's write the Pony for All Act. Let's give every citizen a free pony if they want one. And it can be done. And maybe not literally for every single citizen, but it certainly can be done to a very large scale. So what would it take to do so? The first step is to understand our current situation. We can't know where we're going if we don't know where we are. So I'll use the United States as an example. We have 320 million Americans. We have about 500,000 ponies. This is clearly not going to work. This demand far outstrips supply. We must make these roughly equal. The Pony For All Act by design is for all. So we don't want to decrease demand in this case. We must increase supply. So how do we do that? That's a big ask. Half million has to go up to 320 million. So we have lots of options, but given our current state of technology, given our, the scale that we need to do this, the only option is reproduce. Mommy and daddy ponies are going to have to do their things over and over and over again. Another question we have to answer, how long will it take? In order to answer that, we must understand the biological realities of ponies. How many are there currently? What is their gestation period? How long after giving birth does it, can a mommy do her thing again? What's the minimum age for giving birth? What's the mortality rate? So given our current situation and given these biological realities, we determine it will take roughly 20 years. So let's get started. So we've been taking care of a half million ponies, no problem. But now the population is exploding, and this has enormous consequences. It means that we will need a lot more supplies. It means that we will need to educate millions of more people to help us develop and maintain this. And it means that we will need to distribute all these things around the country to avoid overcrowding and to bring it closer to the people that need them. So the Pony for All Act will create a new industry with lots of good new jobs, which is a good side benefit. We have something much more important that we're trying to get at. So now it's 20 years later, we now have 320 million ponies and it's time for the people to pick them up. They go to Ponies R Us, it's, we have the best staff, it's perfectly organized, that's not what we're talking about here. But the people don't know how to take care of ponies, so we need to train them. Their houses aren't prepared to take care of ponies, so we need to prepare them. So all of the supplies and labor that we just and services that we just spoke about are now needed by everyone. And finally, with 320 million, it is a serious question of what happens when they die. So it takes 20 years, and this is the full life cycle. This is what goes into our bill. And we have not said a word about money. But now that we have determined the resources that are necessary to make it happen, now we can estimate as a final step, estimate the cost of those resources and put it into a section in the bill, authorization of appropriations. So let's say some powerful person says 20 years is unacceptable. I'll, I will make my girl, my little girl wait five years, but I am not making her wait 20 years. You will make this happen. I don't care what it takes. So what are our options? We could make it the law. We could threaten severe consequences and we could throw money at it. $10 trillion, whatever it takes. So the question is, is if we force it to happen faster, what happens? And the answer is nothing. Forcing it to happen faster simply won't work because no amount of money can change biological processes. No amount of money can change how quickly people can be educated, 
<clears throat> how fast we can distribute these things around the country, how long it takes to train citizens, and how long it takes to prepare their homes. This is what's important. To the currency issuer, the only thing that matters is real resources, not money, because to currency users, money is real. To the currency issuer, money is not real. If the resources are available, then creating the money to purchase them is not inflationary. If you have the resources to do it, do it. And if you don't, don't. When I say real resources, real tangible stuff, raw materials, labor, technology, and time, because you can have the stuff, but it takes time to make it happen. Nothing can make the Pony for All Act happen in less than 20 years. The realities of real resources are outside of human control. Money and rules are human created concepts. How many rules you have, how good those rules are, don't matter. Because when it comes down to it, there is no way to ensure that humans follow human created rules. But no matter how corrupt an individual is, or how corrupt a, an organization is, there is no way to violate the realities, the limitations of real resources. So as silly as it is, as resource intensive as it is, we can actually give every citizen a free pony. So why in the world can we not give them universal health care and college? And especially since it requires no resources directly speaking, why can't we cancel student debt? Alan Greenspan is the predecessor, was the predecessor to Ben Bernanke on the Federal Reserve. Here he is speaking with former Speaker Paul Ryan on the subject of Social Security. He, this is congressional testimony, so it is under oath. And he is, in his own way, going to confirm everything that we just discussed, pretending that it's a discussion. Oops. So having personal retirement accounts is, a, is another way of making a, a future retiree benefits more secure for their retirement. And also, do you believe that personal retirement accounts as a component to a system of solvency does help improve solvency? Because when you have a personal retirement account policy, it, it's accompanied with a benefit offset. With that feature in place, do you believe that personal retirement accounts can help us achieve solvency for the system and make those future retiree benefits more secure? Well, I, I wouldn't say that the uh, pay-as-you-go benefits are insecure in the sense that uh, well, there's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. The question is, how do you set up a system which assures that the real assets are created which those benefits are employed to purchase? So it's not a question of security. It's a question of the structure of a financial system which assures that the real resources are created for retirement as distinct from the cash. The cash itself is nice to have, but uh, it's got to be in the context of the real resources being created at the time those benefits are paid so that you can purchase real resources with the benefits, which of course are cash. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the same question? <laughs> oh, he, Paul Ryan regrets asking that because my donors really want me to privatize this. Please tell me that there is a economically, there is an economic justification to please my donors. And Paul Ryan and uh, Alan Greenspan says there's not. It's not a question of economic security. It's a question that the real resources are created for retirement. 
so that you can purchase the real resources with the benefits, which is money. So Green, Alan Greenspan, in his own verbose way, came to exactly the same conclusion. To the currency issuer, the only thing that matters, the only thing that is real, is real resources, not money. Generally speaking, seniors don't need money. They need the things that they can purchase with that money. Next chapter, the federal deficit. The federal deficit is the amount of money spent into the economy minus the taxes that they collect back. Example, the government spends $3 trillion. They tax back $1.7 trillion. So the federal deficit is $1.3 trillion. That's the money left in the economy, left in the people's pockets. Too much spending, a ballooning deficit is not the problem. The only thing that matters is what our government does and doesn't do, and who they do it for and who they don't do it for. The problem is that their spending is immoral and unjust and inequitable and inefficient, and it's funneled to the wealthy few because the wealthy few legally bribe them to do it. Too much spending is not the problem. The problem is income inequality and poisoned water and poverty and suicide and so on. That's reality. What the government does is more important than what's left over. The federal deficit is like our federal paycheck. It is and really should be called our federal, our national income. So when you hear someone important say, it is urgent that we reduce the deficit, what they are saying, whether they know it or not, is that it is urgent that we reduce the people's income that we stop giving the people income. Next chapter, the national debt. So currency users require income before we can spend. We must get money from somewhere before we can spend. If we don't get it from the government, we must get it from somewhere else. So current, an example is we can get it from a bank. So we currency users go to a bank and we ask for a loan, say $1,000. The bank analyzes our, net, our, our histories and our net worth, and they decide if, they are, if we are likely to pay it back, then they give us that money. When we get that money, we are instantly in debt to that bank for $1,000 for $1, plus interest. And this, we are in debt to a private, for-profit corporation. And this kind of debt is scary because the bank will do whatever it takes to get their money back. This is called private debt. Currency users getting a bank loan, there is no equivalent situation for the currency issuer. It's just no, there's just nothing that makes sense compatible. There is no bank above the currency issuer. In the United States, the Federal Reserve must do as, com as Congress commands them to do. And I mean, it's just a ridiculous idea that the God, the one and only God of money, has to go to one of its subjects to ask for the money that only it can create? Alan Greenspan again. Are U.S. Treasury bonds still safe to invest in? Very much so. I think there's a, 
This is not an issue of credit rating. The United States can pay any debt it has because we can always print money to do that. So there is zero probability of default. The United States can pay any debt it has because we can always create money on a computer to do it. There is zero probability of default. Not low probability. He didn't say remote probability. He said zero probability. As long as the government exists, it is impossible for them to not be able to pay its bills. Currency issuers such as the United States do not have a debt. They just don't. Not in any way that means like a debt does to me and you. But practically speaking, the national debt is the accumulation of every federal paycheck from the beginning of the country. So in the United States, the first dollar was created in 1796, the federal paycheck, what we used to call the federal deficit. All of the, net, all of the federal paychecks that have ever been spent, that's practically speaking what the national debt is. The national debt is the debt free savings of the citizens, literally the money in our bank accounts, investments, and wallets. And savings by definition means debt free. Like a paycheck from our job, we do what's asked, we get that money after taxes, and we get to do whatever we want with it. No strings attached, we don't owe it to anyone, it's debt free. The national debt is and should be called our national savings. So the national savings is what we, the people, own, not owe. The problem is not too much wealth. The problem is never too much wealth. The problem is wealth inequality. Who has too much of it and who doesn't have enough of it? So that's practically speaking. The national debt is our national savings. Technically speaking, it is an accounting reflection, roughly an accounting reflection of the national savings. We can talk about that after. The real national debt, however, that really will bankrupt our grandchildren has nothing to do with money. <clears throat> Next chapter, inflation. So those who don't understand MMT or don't want you to understand MMT will say things like the following. Creating money causes inflation. And when you create more than that, it will cause hyperinflation. So if you create a dollar, it will cause inflation. And if you dare create a second dollar, it will cause hyperinflation. The idea that creating money causes inflation is just as ridiculous as saying birth causes crime. All criminals are born. The only thing that causes inflation can be inflationary is spending money on resources that do not exist or there are not enough to go around. Spending money on resources that are fully employed. Inflation is not when the price of bread goes up. It is not when the price of all products in an industry go up. Inflation is when the price levels of goods and services for sale in an economy go up and continue to go up. And roughly speaking, that means everything a average family purchases. So this is inflation. Is this a bad thing? You have $20,000 in debt. Is that a bad thing? Not if you have $50,000 in assets, because in that case you have $30,000 net worth. You need the full picture before you can draw conclusions. 
This is inflation. Your wages are going right up with prices. So do you care about inflation in this case? This is also inflation. Your wages are going up even faster than prices. Then, yes, than prices. Do you care about inflation in this case? This is inflation as well. This is clearly a bad thing, but why is it a bad thing? Our wages have, prices are going up normal, but our wages have stagnated. They are being suppressed. Our wages are artificially low. This is inflation, this is also a bad thing. Our wages are going up normal, but our prices are going up way faster than that. Our prices are artificially high. An example of this is the pharmaceutical industry price gouging American citizens and the government doing nothing to stop it. Inflation can also be a good thing. The government can increase taxes on things that are harmful to society, choosing to create inflationary pressure for the greater good. This is inflation since 1960. The only two inflationary episodes that we have experienced in this country were OPEC oil shocks in the 1970s. OPEC deliberately withheld its product in retaliation for our support of Israel, and that was coupled with our misguided decision to make our society dependent on that one product. So that caused problems. Other than that, there has not been any substantial inflation since 1960, even though during this entire time, every dollar of federal spending has been created currency, financed with created currency. In 2018 alone, $100 trillion in US treasuries were paid back. No inflation. Inflation, the boogeyman, has nothing to do with inflation in reality. <clears throat> we understand the nature of inflation. We have many tools to manage it. And many of those tools can be automated to bypass fickle and corrupt politicians. And, if, uh, and finally, hyperinflation occurring in an economy such as the United States is not just unlikely, it's absurd. Economies such as the United States do not need to raise taxes for the purposes of revenue. And they also have an abundance of resources. And because of these two things, they can provide for all of their people without causing substantial inflation. And when I say provide, I do not mean luxury. I mean stop their suffering. But even with the best designed programs, policies, you cannot predict the future. Resources are destroyed and created and invented every day, new inventions every day. At some point, it may be necessary to increase taxes in order to offset inflation. But the overall burden on citizens will be much lower. And if MMT economists get their way, it will be much lower still after the federal job guarantee is passed into law. So that is pretty much NMT, and I, now I want to say after learning it for a year and looking again at our government and society, the conclusions that I personally draw. So much of the rest of this is what I believe, not what NMT says. So we're going to watch the video at, from the beginning one more time. And I hope there will be a little bit of a different perspective. When are we going to get serious, Candy, about the debt? we got to deal with this big long-term debt problem or it will deal with us. But it's very simple. The government works like your house works. Our government has promised far more money than it actually has or probably ever will have. We have to reduce our deficit, and we have to get back on a path that will allow us to pay down our debt. We understand America is broke. There is an urgent need for us to contain the growth of the deficit. Taking money 
from our children and borrowing from China. Our rising debt levels poses a national security threat. We're broke. America's broke. It is to take out a credit card from the Bank of China in the name of our children, driving up our national debt. When we raise and borrow all this money, 42 cents out of every dollar coming out of Washington, it's borrowed. 47% is coming from other countries like China. Okay, so are they lying? Do they not know better? I, it doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned because I give benefit of the doubt to the powerless. I will not give benefit of the doubt to the powerful who benefit when the powerless are ignorant about how the economy works. Our federal representatives tell us that they can't give us what we need to survive, even though they really want to, because they tell us that not even preventing our suffering in reality is more important than their made up fiscal responsibility. And not only do they pretend that they can't give us these things, they also pretend that they do not know how to give us these things. How are you going to pay for it? Is the question that our government, who does understand how the economy works, asks the people who don't understand how the economy works. So somehow the people need to figure it out for the government before the government gives the people what they need to not die. Our governments have an abundance of resources, but they choose to withhold it. And because, because they are legally bribed to do it. And this leaves the people to fight over the scraps, which causes behavior like this. Please take a moment to read that. I deserve more than you. I deserve more than you. Not because society is unjust and we're all doing the best we can in a terrible situation. No, I deserve more than you because you are less than me. You are less than me. We come up with justifications for our comfort when others needlessly suffer. And we come up with justifications for our suffering when others needlessly comfort. And, that, and while this behavior is disgusting, what's really disgraceful is the system that allows it to happen. Our government allows their people to fight over the scraps when they have more than enough to provide for all. They shame and punish their people for making bad decisions when they could easily prevent us from having to face those decisions in the first place. Our governments manufacture scarcity. And because of this, we have to be terrible to each other and to our families and to ourselves and to our environment just to survive. So our government won't provide for us who's left, but for profit private industry. We are forced into private debt. Our lives are placed on the altar of their profit. They legally bribe our politicians so they can legally steal from us. So the wealthy few sabotage our government with big money and then they turn around and tell us that government is the problem. But they shut us out of the government so that we don't have a chance to make it better, but it doesn't matter because the government is the problem. And then they tell us that the only possible solution is the free market, which coincidentally enriches those who sabotage the government. The problem is not the government, the problem is those who have stolen it from us and locked us out. Currency users have to worry about money. We have to worry about our bills and debt collectors and bankruptcy. We have to worry about what will happen if we can't afford to pay our bills. For us, fiscal responsibility is critical. For us, private debt can be ruinous. 
currency issuers have a lot of things that they need to worry about, but not money. Fiscal responsibility for a currency issuer is nonsensical. Public debt is nothing. So if you remember nothing else from today, please remember a currency issuer is totally different than a currency user. Congressional appropriations. Here is the technically correct answer to how are you going to pay for it. Every federal program is paid for with congressional appropriations. We are a sovereign fiat currency. If we had the resources to do it, you can choose to create the money to purchase those resources to do it. But here's the answer that I believe should be given to this terrible question. We will pay for it by getting you out of office and replacing you with someone who will never ask us that question again. They will do whatever it takes to just get the job done. And until that day, 100% of our energy will be spent making your life a living hell. There is nothing wrong with opposing federal programs, such as a federal job guarantee and so on. But if you oppose them because of economics, if you oppose them because they will raise our taxes, because they will cause inflation, because um, it is too expensive, MMT demonstrates that that argument is invalid. So either you should reconsider your opposition or come up with a more honest argument for your opposition. Great things are possible. They're possible now. And they have always been possible. But they will only happen if we stand up and demand them. We will never stand up and demand them until we believe that it's possible. Modern monetary theory demonstrates that it is possible. MMT is nonfiction economics. Learning MMT will not stop the corrupt from doing bad things. It won't. Learning MMT will stop the corrupt from stopping us from doing good things. Thank you. Thanks,